Good, good evening, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another one of our wonderful uh, events. It's such an honor uh, to have yet another legend coming to uh, the Tring Book Festival. And without further ado, can I welcome our host, Neil Carmichael Jones and David Harewood. I want to say thank you all for coming. It's uh, a bit grey and miserable out there, but um, you've all come, so wonderful. So welcome. Welcome to Tring. Lovely. Nice Festival. to be here. Nice Have to... you been up this way before? Um, no, I haven't, no. You need to come back. There's so much it's, here. It won't be my last time. <laughs> here for the drama school. We've got a very good drama school oh, here. Really? Yeah, Tring School of Performing Arts. Ah, Andrew good. Newton was here. Big name. Wow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we're not here to talk about that. So, um... Obviously, you are a Shakespearean actor, you have done the biggest shows on TV with Homeland, Supergun, Arrow, Night Manager, but we're mm. not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you <laughs> and your book, Maybe I Don't Belong, um, belong Here. So can you just tell me, just give me a general idea a about the book and why is you decided to write it? Well, um, I, um, <clears throat> about three, four years ago, I sent out um, a, a friend of mine who knows I, I have a, an interest in mental health matters, um, <clears throat> she said, you know, it's World Mental Health Day, you should send out a, a tweet, as a supportive tweet. And I was on my way to America, so I, uh, I, I, I sent out, I just casually sat down and sent out this tweet saying, as someone who's had a breakdown, just want to say, uh, look after yourself today, get some help if you can, and take care. And that was as... Well, I sent it, oversharing, um, <laughs> sent it, and, and then went to the airport, turned the phone off, flew to America, turned my phone on, and like 40,000 retweets. <laughs> Immediate, like, oh my God, what have I done? Um, and um, BBC on the phone, were on the phone, ITV were on the phone, you've had a breakdown! And, <laughs> and of course, I'm t I tell all my friends about my, my, the breakdown that I had. It, it, sort of, it was always a bit of a a bit of a late night drunken anecdote that I was sectioned. Uh, I, I just hadn't even really thought about it. But from, from that tweet, I wrote an article in The Guardian, because they wanted to know about it. And I wrote this article about my experiences. And then a friend of mine, who was uh, with me when I was having my uh, psychiatric experience, read the article and was heard to say, that's not how I remember it. And I thought, what have I, have I, you know, your, your memory plays tricks on you. So I thought, have I, have I got this completely wrong? So I then pitched an idea to the BBC to say, let me investigate my own, my own breakdown. Um, and that's, a, that's on the iPlayer now called Psychosis and Me. And um, it was a, probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. Because yeah. it was a really, a real shock to my system to find the truth behind my breakdown and to also discover just how ill I was. I completely had buried this experience and just got on with the rest of my life and my career. But doing this documentary made me realize, A, I could have died because I was restrained by seven policemen at one point and given what they call, what's called an emergency sedation, which is literally where they sit on you and stick a, stick a load of tranquilizers in your, in your arm and several people of color have died that way by being restrained by, by uh, law enforcement. So I was very, very lucky to survive that. Very, very lucky to then be sectioned and, uh, and um, I, I think I was in there for five days. Um, and part of this, part of the documentary, and this is a long, long answer to your question, but, <laughs> but, 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 but part of that, uh, that experience it was, it was such a, such a earth-shatteringly mm -hmm. powerful experience for me to rediscover that. And I was also given my medical notes. Yeah. The BBC found my medical records in the bowels of this psychiatric hospital on microfilm. And uh, I was handed my medical records. Everything I said and everything I did when I was in this 
mental institution 30 years ago was recorded. And reading that was really difficult. Um, in fact, I couldn't read it. Uh, I didn't read it for two years. Um, but when I eventually, George Floyd, the pandemic happened, George Floyd, that led me to writing, um, so that, 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 that was the first chapter that I, what, what, what I wrote, was about my experience growing up in England. I was gonna say, did you feel because of all the George Floyd stuff that you kind of had responsibility to tell your story? It wasn't really, a it felt like it wasn't really a responsibility. It was, it was, I'd been asked to write, I'd been asked to write the book. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't know, I'd never written a book, and I thought, yeah. how do you do that? You know, where do you start? But when George Floyd happened, um, there was this, I, I, I just sensed on social media, oh, there's my mic. I just sensed on social media and, and, and in, in, in various other um, in platforms that people were sort of saying, oh, we don't really have racism in England. Yeah. <laughs> and laugh you laugh <laughs> I laugh too but 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 I I just got this sense that, that that's what people were saying and I I immediately wrote a chapter about my about growing up yeah and that's the, I think that's the first chapter in the book and I sent that to my agent and she was like keep going Amazing. and um so tell us about growing up tell us about growing up in Birmingham what it was like what you're good yeah well it was early I mean pretty idyllic at first you know, um, <clears throat> wonderful memories, and I, I write about early memories before before leaving uh, before leaving the house as a, as a, as a young child. Um, quite idyllic, and um, a, sen a sense that a, a, a sense that you know, I think we were the only black family on the street, um, and um, I had a sense outside that. People didn't like us, and people were staring at us. Um, occasional brick through the window, and um, uh, so there was always a sense of danger. Was it referred to in your family? Was it referred to in your family? Like, did your mum? No. Well, my mum, my mum has always been in incredibly strong and strident, and um, there's a wonderful story of her in the book. When uh, one, one of my first memories was was um, looking for my brother. I was looking for my older brother, Roger. And I looked out at the back fence. I, looked, I opened the back door and I poked, poked, poked my head around and this brick just hit me in the face. And I was about four years old. And um, my mom went, you know, cleaned me up and went to the station and very calmly said to this police officer, you know, if you don't come back and sort my racist neighbors out, You'll be back later, taking them to the morgue and me to prison. And she, but she, she always said she had this really great turn of phrase, and she was really unafraid. And she, when when she did kind of catch the guy, she grabbed him up, <laughs> threw him up against the wall. She was she was fiercely protective of us. Of, of us. My dad was different. My dad very um, didn't talk about it. it right. Didn't talk about it. And I think I tried to, as I got older, I tried to, I tried to reach out to him and talk to him about my experiences on the street, being chased by skinheads and being called names and stuff like that. And I, I just, I didn't really understand it. I think that's where the book title comes from, mm -hmm. was that, that um, you know, as a five-year-old kid, when someone tells you to go back to where you came from, yeah. it's very confusing. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'm from Birmingham. I don't understand what you mean. And yeah. So it was a very confusing time, that time of, of uh, thinking that you're English. Mm -hmm. But, but being told to f off back. You know? Yeah. So it was, back to where? That's that, and, I, and that's really, I think, where my whole kind of schism of 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 my identity, I think, started. Yeah, and I guess that's the title of the book with the maybe. It's always the maybe that I kind of really focused on with it because it's like that real kind of, well, maybe I don't belong. Like you know, it's not like I don't belong because you have got that question, you have got that strength in you from your mum probably, of well, being like, actually, this is up for discussion. It's, it's, it's interesting because it is a, um, and a, 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 be a, honestly, I'm, a, I'm kind of amazed that my, my Instagram, my Instagram um, uh, platform has, has sort of become this sort of hub for lots of people to come and ask me questions and, okay. and lots of people talking about psychosis and mental health. Um, I, and I, I answer all of them, but 
a lot of people kind of come to me and say, I, had ex I have exactly that same. And it's not just about color. Mm -hmm. It could be about people who tell me when they came to, first time they came to London or when, when they went to university. Just feeling they, were, they were working class and they were suddenly in a middle class environment. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel that they belonged. So I think the title is very clever in, in, in a sense that it's, it's a catch all. Yeah. It's not just about race. It's just yeah. when, when you feel as though in, there's a difference, there's a, there's a sense of, um, a sense of belonging that, that maybe there's a question mark over that sense, yeah. your sense of belonging. So after the, um, your upbringing kind of in, in Birmingham and kind of, you know, the, the racism and the hate that kind of came towards you, was it, did it feel like a natural progression to what's going to go into acting? That was the thing, because acting always feels like a bit of a privileged thing to go into. Very. And yet, was it just something that you couldn't ignore within yourself? No, well, look, you know, and I don't want to give everybody the impression that it was, it was always a nightmare. I mean, that's the thing about the racism of the Please. time, is that it, you could go for weeks, months without anything. And I had a wonderful kind of upbringing, very cosmopolitan, lots of friends, Irish, Indian, <coughs> Pakistani. It was a really lovely time um, for me and always playing sports and playing gags and joking. I really enjoyed myself at school. I was a clown really at school. <laughs> and um, uh, three or four weeks before leaving school, my teacher, came up to me and said, what are you going to do when you leave school? And I said, I don't, I don't know. He said, well, we think uh, in the staff room we've been talking, we think you should be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was a light bulb moment. <laughs> it was a real eureka moment. And I, was, I said I'd always been the classroom clown. I'd always been sort of making people laugh and never, never sort of aggressively, but um, very mischievous. And they obviously saw, some, they saw something in me. And within two weeks, I was at the National Youth Theatre, auditioned for loads of places, got lots of rejection letters, but then got into the National Youth Theatre, found a real joy for, it's like you find your tribe. Yeah. I'd found my tribe. And um, I, I, I just, I, 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 could, I could mess around and sort of, and, and other people, and I, I just felt like I, I, was in, I was in the right set. Okay. <clears throat> and... From there, they said to me, you should go to drama school. So I ended up at um, RADA. As you do. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> and then were you definitely in your set there once you were at RADA? Very much so. And, and, and also, I, you know, it's interesting being at a book festival, but, you know, I think at school, I think everyone learns differently, right? I think everybody sort of maybe, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I was ready for academia at school. I was just too busy having a good time. <laughs> Chasing girls, you know, playing sport, having a laugh with my mates. But when I got to RADA, mm -hmm. I just found this love of literature. Right. Shakespeare, and Moliere, Chekhov, Dostoevsky, all these fantastic writers that... And I was suddenly playing, I don't know, French romantic and imagining myself on the hills of southern France <laughs> and chasing a farm girl. And, you know, and playing, you know, Romeo and doing Chekhov. And I was just transported to this world of complete make-believe, which I'd always been anyway, as a, as a clown and as a person who, who, you know, I've always had a great imagination. So, so, so uh, to find a, an avenue for it, to, yeah. a, a channel for it, I was like, yeah, give me that, I'll have that. And it was very easy for me. I found it very easy. And um, uh, as I say, I got, you know, you know, I, I just, I'd, I'd found the tribe, I'd found my lane, mm -hmm. and I was excelling in, in, in this new world of literature and, and, and really developed a real appreciation of, of stuff. So when did things start to turn? Because that thing, like you've gone through, obviously you're saying your, your childhood was idyllic, it was lovely with moments of horrificness, and then you find your tribe, you find this place, something you love, you enjoy. Mm. But and in the book you talk about how you'd go and do was it Roman Judy or well, you, you did a, th a Shakespearean play that you just did as a play, mm. but then people are calling it the black version of this is the problems. The problems for me started when I left drama school, because as I say, at drama school, I was just David and, um, <clears throat> you know, playing Romeo and doing Macbeth, and doing King Lear and nobody batting an eyelid. But as soon as I left drama school, suddenly you're a black actor. And you don't play these roles, you play these roles. 
And these roles are off limit to you because they're leading roles. And black actors don't play leading roles. So, and I, just so suddenly my imagination was, was, had limits on it. Mm. I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, parts were off limits to me. And I found that really difficult to navigate. And uh, my first job was, was playing Romeo in a, a professional production. And um, the press were really hostile. Mm. And we were that, we were that, I was that first generation of British born, black, classically trained actors. You know, there'd been a, there'd been a, you know, Mona Hammond and, and Rudolph Walker, and there'd been a generation of West Indian actors who'd come over, who'd, you know, come over with my parents' generation that were, were trained actors who were, had played the classics, but we were the first British born black actors to come out of the British system School, school system and play classical, t take classical mm. roles. And the hostility was extraordinary. You know, how are they, why are you being allowed to play this role? And mm -hmm. uh, the critics were really vicious to me. Did you feel like you were trailblazing? Did it feel like something you had to fight? Um, I, I, I didn't feel that I was, but I, but I, didn't, did I didn't feel that. Looking back on it, yes, yes we were. Um, but but um, you know, we, we we were just just we were just trying to work, uh, and you were working. I worked all the time. Yeah, I worked all the time, and um, but it was it was it was a difficult period to navigate. When you're reading about yourself in the paper, and I think one reviewer said he he, you know, he looks more like Mike Tyson than Romeo, and and one one other reviewer said. Apparently, this young man went to RADA. Why did they let him in? Why did they let him out? Oh, and it was sort of really surprised. personal. Yeah. It was really personal. In fact, it was, I had to stop reading my review yeah. because it was really undermining me yeah. and really undermining my confidence and undermining my, my, um, my ability to, you know, I'd, 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 as I said, I'd always been sort of been this happy go lucky, jovial. <laughs> kid just having a laugh yeah and suddenly um it was all getting very serious and very personal i guess as an actor you just have to lose yourself in a role but they're not letting you lose yourself because you're so aware of who you are doing that role yeah um and i just became overly conscious of mm -hmm. my my race yeah and um because it was the first thing every, uh, any reviewer said yeah um so i felt like i was being rejected very much by um by the established space, the white space, as I call yeah. it in the book. But then also, because I was choosing to play roles that were sort of controversial. Mm -hmm. I played, um, I did a role um, uh, entertaining Mr. Sloan, Joe Orton play. And Sloan is a devious bisexual murderer. Funny as hell. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, the local paper didn't, local black community, well, like, how dare you play this role? Oh. And so they were telling me I shouldn't be doing this. So I felt like I'd suddenly, not only was I rejected by the white space, it was the black space rejecting me. So I really was in trouble. And I began yeah. to, the only way I could get on stage was to drink. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I totally lost my confidence. Uh, and I, 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 that's when things started to unwind, I think. Okay. And so then did you start noticing that you were kind of, Losing grip isn't the right word, is it? Because it's not something you're Well, that's the thing. With, with psychosis, you don't know. And that's the incredibly worrying and scary thing. And again, I've, um, I, I mean, I'm glad I made that, that documentary. And I'm glad I've written this yeah. book because it's really sort of put psychosis on the map. Yeah. Because um, it, it is extremely common. Mm -hmm. Race is no determinant. Class is no determinant. Sex, no determinant. Intelligence is no determinant. Mm -hmm. It happens to everybody. Or can happen to everybody, and as I say, I my again my, my people sliding into my DMs this last couple of months of all sorts of people really desperate, reach, trying to reach out and say, my son's at university, he's been acting strange. I went to see him, and now he's sleeping on the street. What do I do? It's it's a it's an extraordinarily powerful experience, mm -hmm. very traumatic, not just for the people going through it, but for the people it's experiencing right. it, and. Um, you have no idea because it's, it, it, when it starts very slowly. And it, once it gets a grip of you, once it gets a hold of you, unless it's addressed, 
you feel that you're in complete control. You feel you're superhuman. You feel you can fly. You can, it's the most, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Just, I, I, I envy, you know, I wish I had 10% of that because it gives you this sense of power. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are experiencing psychosis think they can control the weather. Think they can, you know, and, and, and a lot of people who have been through it uh, who you know, feel it's deeply spiritual. Really? Because you feel you hear these voices and you get this sense of, of uh, there's, a, there's a, an, an excess of dopamine. And dopamine is that chemical in your brain, in your body, which gives you that natural high. Um, having sex, having an orgasm gives you an excess of dopamine. When you're happy, you have an excess of dopamine. Mm -hmm. So when you've got psychosis, you've got this sort of, you're not sleeping, most of the time you're not sleeping, um, but you, 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 you get this euphoria. And unless you uh, address it pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, it can really grab you. As I say, it could be addictive. If you're you, getting that absolutely. dopamine, then you want to get that high again. You want to get that high. I mean, it's, not even, it's not even you want to get it again, because you've, got, you, you've constantly it's, got it. Fine. And rather than addressing it, mm -hmm. going to the doctors and saying, you know what, I think I'm flying here. You just, you just go, you know, I can, as I did, I can control this. I know I'm not well, but I, if I can control this, I'm going to have a great time yeah. because I'm really sort of, you know, hyperactive. I'm not sleeping. I know I'm not sleeping, but I feel great. And uh, you just lose control of it. Were you still able to work? I, that's how I got, I, I was working when I got, when I did Sloan, I was two months away from being sectioned. Yeah. So I was not well when I was working. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite fortunate as, as, as an actor, you know, I mean, as, as an actor, you, you can kind of half get away with it because, because you, you, you're sort of, um, I mean, that, that, that character is quite intense. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one night, the stage manager came up to me and he said, he said, you were on fire tonight. I said, yeah, I said, I'm really enjoying myself. He said, no, he said, you took 10 minutes off the show. <laughs> He said, what? He said, yeah. He said, you were just like absolute. And he said, the audience were right in the palm of your hand. I was flying. I was not God. well. Yeah. But because I could channel it into my part, yeah. um, I, I guess I could master it. I always wondered whether it would kind of almost help in your career. It's like, you know, artists in the past would take drugs or they'd take something to help them kind of touch into that Look, kind of artistic, creative person within them. There's a thing about actors, you know, and, you know, many, many great actors have been alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And um, I've worked with actors who need a shot of whiskey before they work. Yeah. Uh, it's very dangerous um, because it's something that you become to rely on. Mm -hmm. So I would never, I would never encourage that. Um, but certainly the acting profession, there's, there's all, all manner of afflictions and, and addictions in, in, our, in our profession yeah. that, that people somehow mask. Yeah. and managed to uh, continue their career. Yeah. So tell us about the first time. You were saying that you were doing that play two months before you got sectioned. Tell me, if you're okay with it, what, what happened to get you sectioned? What was going on there? What, what did... What well, I would, I would basically wake up um, on Oxford Street at three o'clock in the morning and think, how the hell did I get here? Mm. And I'd say to myself, oh, I better go home. And then I'd start walking home and then the next thing I know, it would be two o'clock in the afternoon and I'd be in a completely different area of London. And I would have no idea yeah. how I got from one place to the other. So I was blacking out quite a lot and um, losing consciousness. And um, friends started to notice, friends my friends were very, very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they were very worried. And a couple of them, I mean, thank, heavens for my friends really. yeah. because they all three of them moved into my house um because they knew something wasn't right mm -hmm. and um i would just disappear i would slip out of the house at two o'clock in the morning and go go wandering and they wouldn't know where you were. and they wouldn't know where i was wow. so on one of these occasions i i um slipped out i had this extraordinary this is where it was really spiritual and deep and I heard the voice of Martin Luther King in my head. And I'm not, I mean, honestly, I'm not, I, I don't, I, I've never experienced 
anything like it. It was a crystal clear voice that seemed to be independent of me telling me what to do. And it was very scary. Mm -hmm. and, and I did everything this voice told me to do. His voice said, get dressed and walk to Camden. You need to go walk. To, and it had this huge, like cosmic, interplanetary reason that I had to follow, which was it's in itself extraordinary. Yeah. He said it was the voice of Martin Luther King. And he said that I, I uh, the minute he was shot, he said, the minute I died, he said, I, 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 um, I'm speaking to you from beyond the grave. And I'm an angel now in heaven. And there's a, there's a gap between good and evil. And I'm choosing several people around the world who are going to close that gap tonight. And I've chosen you. And I'm crying in my bedroom thinking, my little king is speaking to me. From God. Yeah. It's just the most extraordinary yeah. thing. And um, I, I got up, walked to Camden. Obviously, the place that he told me to go was closed because it was the middle of the night. Um, and then I got, ex I was exhausted. And I thought, well, how am I going to get home? And I saw this cab and I went, oh, thanks, Martin. Martin sent the cab for me. Got into this cab, had no money. And, and, uh, and then I just, I, I remember just seeing the driver looking at me in the mirror. And I don't, I don't know what I was saying or what I was doing, but um, he, I remember him getting out of the cab pulling me out of the cab, <coughs> sitting me on the, on the side of the street. And then I remember all these flashing blue lights, police lights. Okay. And one of the things about being sectioned, unfortunately, particularly if you're black, but there's a huge link between criminality, between illness and criminality. Okay. Because you're disturbed and not very well, um, you could be raging and... and violent. And, well, you're not even violent, but people okay. think you're violent. Oh, people think, okay and uh, they'll call the police. Mm -hmm. And the police will come, and if you're unlucky, the police can be quite, quite heavy-handed. Yeah. And uh, rather than going to hospital, you can go to prison. And that's a lot of people that disappear like that mm -hmm. into the system. I was very, very fortunate because um, uh, I, the, the taxi driver obviously called the police. The police took me to a cell. Mm -hmm. I was um, kept overnight and then released in the morning. And in the, after, in the morning, I, had not, I, I couldn't even remember my name. I, I, all the voices were gone. It was almost like this storm had just like ripped through my brain. And I, I didn't know who I was. And I couldn't remember my name. Jesus. And uh, this duty solicitor said to me, okay, let's start the basics. He can't remember your name. Where, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Birmingham. He said, do you have, you know, you got family? I said, yes, I've got family. He said, what's your dad's name? And I said, my dad's name's Romeo. And my, mother, my dad's name is Romeo Cornelius Harewood, which is extraordinary. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> I, said, I said, my dad's name's Romeo. And he went, like the play. And I went, ah, oh, play. I'm an actor. I'm an actor. I'm an actor. I went to RADA. I went to, and then I followed my track through the parts that I played. And I found, I realized who I was. Wow. And uh, I finally got out of the, cell, got out of the court, and thank heavens, this, the lady that was in the court, complete stranger, uh, came up to me and said, are you okay, son? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know who I am. And she said, look, where do you live? And I couldn't remember. And she said, what's your nearest tube station? And I said, Highbury and Islington. And she flagged the cab down, paid for a cab, and said, take this boy to Highbury and Islington. And I got out at Highbury Islington, and my mates were just literally running towards me because they'd been out looking for me. And I then started to hyperventilate and pass out, and they thought, we've got to take him home. So um, they put me in the back of their car, but then I started to kind of pass out, and they thought I was dying, rushed me to the hospital. And, a, and, 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 I, and if, you've, if you've seen Psychosis in Me, which is on the BBC iPlayer, I ask you to watch Very it. Very good. Um, when my mate was telling me this story in the hospital, I didn't know any of this. I could see he started to cry. And I was like, I don't remember any of it. And apparently I was running into the hospital screaming, I have to save the boy. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And um, police 
got me, sat on me, sedated me, and five days later I woke up. <laughs> There's so much to That's how I got it. <laughs> a lot you to asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you think that you weren't sent to prison after that first one? Do you think it was just, just was the luck lucky. of the I, people? I was, the luck of people who were there, the police officers were there, that woman in the court that was there, yeah. they saw the person behind it. Um, I, was just, I, I was just lucky that, that rather than... I mean, I, was obviously, I, I, know, I, was, I know I was incarcerated overnight, mm -hmm. and from that night, I went, excuse me, I went to um, the, the, the courts in the morning, and then I was basically released. Fine. Um, so that's how I got back. That, that, then my friends yeah. took, took me back. But, uh, and, but, and then the police were called from, from the hospital. When I started to freak out in the hospital, the, the, uh, the hospital security were just so freaked out by this yeah. very large black gentleman that they called the police. And in the doc, you talk about your, your friend remembers how they came police, what the police oh, did. Oh, they to came you. with... Like, right shields. Yeah, it wasn't subtle. That, no, they, they were there to take me down. Mm -hmm. um, but look, if I'd have been in America, I think I'd probably been shot. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. And several people have been, mm -hmm. uh, or tasered, several people have been and died, died like that. Yeah. So I was extremely lucky to survive. Because you're already in a, in a state where you uh, need care. Massively, massively sort of hyper and um, not well. Yeah. Very ill. Um, and again, since I've been on this huge journey since talking about this, there was a wonderful gentleman who's now a mental health nurse who was telling me that when he had a breakdown, he knew he was, because people sort of, there are people who have episodes, mm -hmm. and he knew he was having an episode, so he actually took himself to a hospital to get help, and they refused him help. So he went to another hospital, and they refused him help because he was, again, they thought he was just a raging, angry, Okay. large black guy and eventually someone called the police uh, and he was uh, locked up and it was only when he was locked up that he got the help he needed so 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 it, I mean the, the system itself I think is need, you know might, might need a huge overhaul yeah 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 something else I think you were talking about how you felt it was it more than one brain in your head yeah that was it's really I mean again it's it's that's the duality, though. This split that I always talk about about myself being black, but also being British, and that, that that's the split that I have in my in my psyche. I think okay. of, and I still have it today. I, I I wish I didn't, but again, it's because of my experiences, I guess. But and it it, man, it manifests itself in uh, I've never bought an England shirt. No, God no. I've got an Italian shirt. I've got a Brazil shirt. I've even got a German shirt. <laughs> I've never bought an England shirt. Why? There's something about, something about, I don't know, it's just something about it. Like, and I nearly bought one when, when we got to the, the, the Euros a couple of years ago. I nearly bought one. And then when, the, when the, the racism, after those three black players missed the penalty, the next day there was this, yeah. this avalanche of racism. Yeah. And it reminded me why I didn't buy it. Yeah. And also the England flowers were weaponized. It's and been, it's been it's weaponized. Been a lot, you know, and I know, yeah. you know, I, I, growing up in the seventies, as I did, seeing it, you know, seeing a Union Jack was terrifying mm -hmm. because skinheads wore Union Jacks, and so Union Jacks for me was a sign of danger. Yeah. So it's difficult for me to have this love of. And I've been made an MBE. I go to the palace. I'm at the palace every other day. You know. I missed the MBE off you know, the your introduction. And it's really weird. I'm at the palace and I'm like, this, I'm right in the heart of it. And, I, you know. and so there's this little schism in yeah. where, I'm, where I, I think to myself, relax, calm down. It's okay. Your identity is settled. But it, 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 is, it still remains mm -hmm. a combative issue yeah. within me. And that's where the two brains, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think it will stay a combative issue until, well, you have to make your peace, don't you, with the people who are using things like the English flag as a weapon. As a gay man, I see an English flag and it puts a fear of God through me. Right. If I see an English flag outside a house, I'll cross the other side of the road. Exactly. Because so, exactly. I'm like, this isn't a street I need to be on. Right, exactly. And you do get that. 
And you have to kind of work out what do you do with that? Where do you go with that feeling? And yeah. you, you, at some point you have to stop fighting. So it's turned to a therapy session now. <laughs> I went to a you <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you're, absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, and I think this book has been really helpful for me. Because yeah. it's, it's, I think since uh, dis- rediscovering this experience and writing the book, uh, I've gone back into therapy. Mm-hmm. And I chose to see a, a black therapist mm-hmm. and uh, a, a black male therapist before I had a female white therapist. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to specifically look at certain aspects yeah. of my identity. Mm-hmm. And that's been really helpful for me yeah. um, to, uh, to, 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 to deal with those, to deal with those questions that are still um, lingering, but because mm-hmm. um, sometimes we're not allowed to talk about them. Sometimes we're yeah. not allowed to, as black people, People, people think black people are one monolithic group, and we're not. We're all very different. And uh, that's okay. Yeah. And, and, and um, I, I guess at times I've felt pressure to be a particular way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I, I'm, this writing this book has made me just relax a bit and say, yeah. I can be an individual. Yeah. It's not like letting the side down. I'm not... At first, I did think there was an issue. There was a, a, a point in me where I thought, am I letting the side down by talking about... Because I think as black men, we're supposed to be strong and yeah. masculine and, you know, we're not supposed to let... You know, we're supposed to be... Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And actually, talking about my vulnerabilities and allowing myself to be vulnerable, it's really allowed other black men to say yeah. to me, thank you so much for that. Because now I can talk about... There's a guy who stopped, stopped me on the street the other day. And this happens all the time now. Guy who stopped me on the street the other day, just literally ran across the street. Well, yo, 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 general, general. And, and he went, I watched your documentary when I was in prison. He said, oh, he said oh, I was like, he said, I was just losing it. He said, I was losing it. And the guard said to, guard said to me, you should read books, you should read. And I said, I, said, I, don't, I don't read. And then one guard said to him, you should watch this documentary from this, this guy, David Hill. And he, yeah, I'm watching that. And then he, he was flicking, and he said he was flicking one night, and eventually he went to it, and it just got him. Yeah. And here he was meeting me in the street, and he, he just said, I want to thank you, man. He said, I want to thank you. He said, now I understand I've got depression. And when I get depressed, you know, I want to harm myself, and I want to I get angry. And he said, now I understand that it's a mental health condition. Yeah. He said, and I just want to say thank you. And was, for me, that, that, that's worth all the pain that I've been through, that I'm helping guys like that who didn't feel that they had an outlet or a chance of understanding. It's helped them go, I need to, this isn't just me. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is black men. This is an issue that we have. That, you know, that mental health is an issue that we have. And, you know, you know, it's something that we, we, should, we, should, we need to address. So again, you're, you're fighting the course as well, because you did the, you're doing the roles when you're acting, starting out, and now you're doing this. So you're doing a very, very important job. Very important job. I guess so, but you know, I, I, I didn't set out to do that. I didn't set out to do it. It's, but but I'm, really, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it probably more than anything I've ever yeah. done. Well, you definitely should be, and I have to say, I've got to say at the beginning that for the first, for the books, the interviews I do, I'd actually bought the book before. <laughs> and I'd read it before. <laughs> oh, really? I'd read it and everything. I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> so it's good. good. That's good. But thanks so much. I think we're going to open up to questions from the audience. So if anyone has any questions, there'll be a roving mic going around at some point. Just raise your Come hands. Come on, there's got to be some questions. <laughs> Come on. There's one over there. I'd say that goes the same for the uh, virtual crowd. Get your questions in, please. Do I know? Yeah, just raise your voice. No, no, stand up and stand up and shout. It's a it's a virtual event, so um, we oh. need your oh, right. online. Hang on. Oh, there it is. There we go. Ah, there we go. Good. The virtual audience won't hear if you don't. Try it again. It's working. You were talking. It's done. It's talking. To I you. think it's working. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, thank you, David. Um, uh, I actually wanted to take you on to the the bit that happens next. Yeah. So you 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 talked about how 
it's very nice that you've helped people who've watched the documentary, you may have read your book, but it's actually trying to move beyond how do we as a society, and I'm not expecting you necessarily to have all the answers to this question, but how do we as a society go from looking at a black man who has obviously got a mental illness to asking the question, which mental institution should he need to go to or how do we get him help rather than saying, right, let's call the cops, let's lock him up, let's taser him. You yeah. know, you spend a night in a cell, you know, you're very lucky to be alive after that. Yeah. You know, so that, and you're, you're, you're the lucky one. So how do we as a society go past that? And maybe it's not for you to take on, but I just really wanted to know your thoughts on your next stages beyond this book. I think I think what I'm what I'm trying to do with the book and by you know engaging people in conversations like this is maybe to raise the level of empathy so that when you see somebody who's clearly distressed or who's clearly not well rather than turning around you know or, or I mean obviously it depends on on what what stage that person's at but just trying to, under, trying, to, trying to raise a level, a level of empathy so that we don't just turn away. And it, it, you know, I was, I was lucky that that woman came out to me in that, in that court and said, are you okay, son? If she hadn't have done that, I don't know what would have happened to me. So she had enough empathy to see I wasn't well, to be unafraid of that, and to come and offer me assistance. And I think, you know, where we see you know, we, we see it clear. I see it in London now. There's, there's far more instances of, of people sleeping on the street, people sleeping rough, people sleeping, uh, uh, people who, are look, who look clearly distressed. And I do my best to engage. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. I can't do it all the time, but I do, I do my best to engage. So maybe as a society, you know, when the so-called crazy person gets on the bus and sits next to you, rather than being scared, maybe saying, is everything are you okay? You know, and even that one conversation yeah. could might just bring them back from the edge, might just bring them back into reality. But hopefully, that's where these discussions and talking about because psychosis is a, is a scary one. People talk about depression and anxiety, and they've, they've almost become quite cool. No one talks about psychosis because it's really scary and quite traumatizing. Uh, but maybe we need to start talking about that because it's happening more and more and more. And, um, you, you know, if, 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 we can, if we can just lower the levels of stigma and lower the level of fear, then hopefully we can save maybe a, a few, you know, save one or two more people. Yeah. So maybe that, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, it needs to hire. I think we've got I've some got, questions online. Yeah, I've got a... Ginny, um, actually, no, I'll go to Elizabeth first. There's a, there's a few questions. It's a quick one, really. Are you worried it might happen again? Is it, is it, is it are you? No, um, I, I'm, I, um, there's like 15% of people who've suffered psychosis who never need further treatment, never need further medication. And I just so happen to fall into that 15%. That being said, um, I am very aware, what's it, come on. Uh, <laughs> time to go. Was that me? <laughs> time to go. Everyone else. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah. I'm very aware of, of now when I get overtired. And sometimes, you know, being an actor and now writing a book, you know, you know uh, the, the asks on you can, can, can be uh, a lot. So I'm, I, I have these little alarm bells that ring that say, Dave, you need to take, you need to say no. And saying no is quite tough for me because I like to, mm -hmm. I like to, you know, help people. But sometimes I've just got to say, I can't do that, you know, because I'm overtired. And I, I know if I get overtired, there's a possibility of it happening. A possibility of me, not happening again, but a possibility of me uh, suffering. So, so I, I, I watch out for when I'm uh, just doing too much. So that's, that's, that's how I would answer that question. I don't think I'll have psychosis again, but I, I, I know what I, what's good for my mental health. 
and a walk in the, a walk with the dog is good for my mental health. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I take a, I take the dog out. Rain or shine, I'll take the dog out. Mm -hmm. That's my hour of bliss. Yeah, it's being self-aware. Yeah, being just aware really, of how really keys me in. Is there another question? Like the microphone. Hello there. Hello. That was really, really, really interesting. I could listen to you all evening. I, I just wanted to say, um, I work in mental health, and a lot of the clients that I work with with psychosis, um, they also experience PTSD symptoms as a result. I just wondered if that was your experience. No, I've, honestly, I've, I've, um, I've uh, never, never really. I mean, I, I did, I did have a relapse, and again, that was thirty years ago, uh, and that was partly my fault. Um, substance, what substance I've done. But um, I've never ever had any sort of PTSD or anything like that. But I, and I, and I, honestly, as, as I say, a lot of people have been contacting me over the course of the run of this book tour. Many people who've had psychosis who really feel it's been a, a benefit to them. They really, think, they really feel that it was a something, it was a breakthrough for them, a spiritual breakthrough for them. It's given them. Uh, a, a real, it's, it's, it seems to have given them a real, um, it's almost sort of opened them up. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the, 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 the medical uh, field has, has, has got things right, but I, I wonder whether we do look at the spiritual element of it. Uh, because I really, feel it, 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 I really feel it's given, part of my success as an actor, I think, is down to my experiences uh, through my psychosis. It's really given me something, a fearlessness. And I, 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 I would not uh, have it any other way. I'm glad I went through it. I'm, I'm glad I came out of it, yeah. but I'm glad I went through it. I've got another one. Um, but I'll, and there's one on the top row as well. Um, we'll go to after this one. But Ginny uh, asks, have you ever thought there was an alternative somewhere you might belong? Several of my friends have looked at their African West Indian origins to resolve their schism that they feel. Yes. Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, and I write about this, you know, because I, I, I travel quite a lot, but I go to, uh, I go to America and, uh, you know, I'm kind of welcomed into the kind of black communities in America and I feel it feels it feels great but at the same time there's there's also a section of the black community in America that don't like British black actors <laughs> take out, <laughs> taking their taking roles their jobs. so <laughs> so you suddenly go oh, I can't I'm not at home there and then you go to Barbados and they go you're an Englishman and then you go to, I, I remember being in Kenya one year with Cafod and um I was the representative of CAFOD. It's in the book. I was the representative of CAFOD. And, uh, and I turned up in this village in the middle of Africa, middle of deepest, darkest Africa. And their faces were. And they called the whole village out. <laughs> Elders, women, men. And then this guy got up and he made this huge speech. And I said to my guy, I said, what's he talking about? He said, he's calling you the Umzungi, Umzungu, the white man. <laughs> <laughs> Because you are, they've, they've never seen the representative from Cafod, it's black. So they were saying, you are the, our long lost son returned as the Umzungu, <laughs> as the sort of big white, and I, it was so, it was extraordinary for me wow. to, to, to kind of deal with that. But I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some people do feel a sense of belonging when they find their um, heritage. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've traced my family back to 1820, 1820 in Barbados. Um, and it's difficult to get beyond that because yeah. of slavery. Yeah. But uh, that was quite moving as well, yeah. to, see, to see the name Harewood. And I, I, I don't know, has anyone been to Harewood House in Leeds? Yeah. Uh, I've recently come back from Harewood House in Leeds. And, um, the Lassells family. The Lassells family. And actually, David, David Lascelles, who's the current Earl of Harewood, has actually done more. F I went to school with him. With, went to school with, with one of the Lassells. I can't remember which one. Well, he's done more. He's the first Earl of Harewood who's been honest about where the money came from. Yeah. And he's actually been very upfront about it. And we've, we've developed a friendship and uh, a relationship. 
And um, it's odd, it's odd. Yeah. But you know, when, when I see the family tree and I see, I see slaves, slave names, and then you see, because it was the, the emancipation of slavery, slaves, all slaves were given the surname of the slave owner. And then you see Richard Harewood, Bartholomew Harewood, uh, Henry Harewood, Romeo Harewood, and then David Harewood. You actually see a link. You are connected to that slave. You, you see a link to it. You think, yes. my word, it's, so, it's very powerful. It lasts. And quite emotional. Yeah. And then to walk around Harewood House and see all this finery and think that somehow you're connected to it, it's, uh, it's a lot to deal with. It's a lot to deal with. Particularly identity as well. <laughs> you're connected to it, but you're not allowed to be connected to it. It's your family, your well, heritage. It's, it's yeah. It's, it's it's that's it's part of that. It's part of the. Uh, it's part of the challenge, I think. Of yeah. Trying to meld these identities together. Yeah. There's a there's a question from the top there. Hello, Hello David. Um, I, I work with young people quite a lot in the work that I do in social care and one of the biggest debates that we have at the moment is around young people's need to belong, having a sense of identity. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, what you've been through, would you, you would definitely describe that as trauma in your life, would you not? Um, and I would say also when you talk about maybe I don't belong here, what is it for you that you want to belong to? <laughs> um, God, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I feel I feel I I, I feel I belong. The, the one thing I do feel I belong to uh, is uh, <laughs> I feel very strongly linked to um, the black community, and uh, you know, not always. I mean, sometimes. I get slings and arrows, but that's not an identity that I feel very connected to. Um, it's an unexplainable thing that when you are around other black people, you know, I feel, I feel quite happy. Um, um, but Nash, I don't know, but I, I, I guess, you know, if I was an Italian, I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd, I'd put the flag up and I'd, I'd, I'd feel, I'd feel very connected. I'd, that would be my identity. I'd, I'd feel very, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> but you can belong with your chosen family, with your chosen group. Yeah. You, and, I'm, I'm, and if your chosen group isn't just... My, if my, my, I guess my chosen group is, 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 is actors, I guess, or, or being in the acting world. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, that's really interesting because I know that, you know, in America, you can be a Polish American, an Irish American, or African American, yeah. and you can kind of pledge allegiance to the flag. So I'm not sure being in Britain that, and it, you, you, I heard it just during the week when you know <coughs> you listen to LB, uh, listening to LBC and hearing people talk about Rishi Shunak and how he's not really he's not really British, yeah, and and I I, I, I guess that's. That's, that's, that's always going to be a question. Mm -hmm. Can I be British? Can I be English and black? And um, I don't know if the younger generation have that. I think the young, younger generation are much easier with that. Yeah. Um, seeing Lewis Hamilton when he wins at Silverstone, crowd surfing with the Union Jack. And he, he hasn't got any of those hang-ups that I've had growing up in the 70s. Yeah. I, don't, I think it was because of growing up in the 70s mm -hmm. um, and the National Front and what that flag meant to me. Yeah. It's difficult for me to get over that hurdle. But I don't know if the younger generation have that. No, hopefully not. Um, but it'd be interesting to talk to you further about that. That's a good question. <laughs> well, so I suppose what I was thinking was, is the word choice, so that you have the ability to choose what, what you want to belong to. So if I was... If the, you... dangers, the dangers of me choosing... Uh, I, I, this is how I'll answer that. The dangers of me choosing that English, British identity, identity is the pain it causes me when I'm rejected from it. Absolutely, yeah. You've got to pick and that's, yeah. honestly, yeah. it just destroys me. Yeah. And it destroyed me as a kid. Absolutely. To, to, yeah. to say to myself, yeah, I'm English, I'm that, got, sorted. Yeah. Yeah. And then somebody will tell me to f off back to where I came from. Yeah. It's just too painful for me to... Um, it's no, it's no good us saying that that's a small-minded bunch of very, a small bunch of idiots that 
Just don't reflect mind. real opinion, real genuine. Fun. I, I wish it. I wish it were. I, I wish it were. But it's just too painful to me to. To. Um, I, I tend to agree experience. with you in terms of um, putting on an England shirt. I've got an England shirt. I've got the red one, the, the, the 1966 kit. And I feel kind of weird putting it on. Really? Yeah. And I'm white and middle-aged and, yeah. It's still, if I, feel, I, put it, I put it on and I feel like I'm a thug. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Because it's a uniform. It's so weird. It, I, honestly, so I'm with you on that. And yet, I've had a very different background to you. Yeah, it's <laughs> odd, odd. We've got time for one more, do you think? Yeah, if, come on, another couple of crackers. There's, There's um, two questions here, two, two, got questions. two questions. We'll, we'll do yeah. both of these and then we'll call it a day. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's lovely to see you here. Thank you for coming. I'm, I'm obviously also black and British. I was born in England to parents from Trinidad. And I get curious because this is my interest of getting underneath this sense of what, what it, you know, we all belong mm. on the earth somewhere. What's, what, I just get curious about like kids growing up with a sense of embracing more than a narrow range of people that they might belong to. How can we make that bigger? And it comes to the spiritual thing of how can we all belong with our roots in the earth? And everybody matter in a similar way. Mm. And can we grieve for all those yeah. deep pains that have come from not belonging <laughs> and the hurt? Because it sort of really matters to me, you know, how hurt happens today, but there's also the hurt that happened, you know, 50 years ago yeah. that <laughs> lives in your body and the hurt of your ancestors that lives in your body. And I just wanted to just to ask you, you know. How do you maybe envisage your gifts helping others not to hide themselves, but to be you know, fully true to who we are, mm. no matter where that is? I think that's sort of how I would answer that, kind of that question. You know, when it comes to belonging, I, I feel like I'm a human being and um, that I, I'm careful about ascribing anything to a particular tribe. We've all got tribes and we've all got groups and, and you know, part, part of my growing up or my experience was, you know, uh, uh, when I came out of drama school, came out of RADA, speaking the way I do, black people went, you're too posh, you're not black enough, you're too white. And it was really painful to me. And, and, and actually now, I don't care. And I've, I'm much more at home with myself. But that's taken a lot of work to get to a place where you're happy with yourself. And just because he says I'm not black enough, you know, part of my success as an actor has, become, has been that I have this crossover appeal or I, I you know, I can play the head, of the, the head of the CIA, you know, in Homeland because I've got this sort of authority and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, it's a central, it's a, it's, a, it's a centrality maybe, a neutralness. And that's what I work for. That's why I changed my accent uh, coming from drama school, because I wanted to be, I didn't want to play Brummies all my life, like talking like that, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to play Brummies all my life, so I, ch I changed my accents, and, you know, and so I want to be able to move and change and be everything. And that, uh, I, 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 and I would hope that our, our kids, uh, or our young, the younger generation, don't grab on to any <laughs> one specific identity. They say, you know, you know we are, part of the global community. You'd hope. We'd hope. Last question. Um, well, Shakespeare was a Brummy, so that's... There you go. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Love your work. I'm looking forward to reading the book. I have a question about acting. What parts do you want to play? Um, we might have a crack at Hamlet next, at some point. Uh, uh, um, but again, that was one of the parts that was just off limits to me as a kid. You can't play that. So maybe now I can, you know, and I've gone off to the States and I've, you know, earned a few quid and, and, and you know, I'm in a position where I can choose a, a little bit now, which is great. And um, not many actors get to that position. So uh, hopefully in the next five years are my five years where I can choose to play the roles that I want to do and, and experience the, the type of roles that I couldn't do when I was 
30 years ago. They, just, they were just off limits to me. Yeah. And it's interesting because I'm now I'm going to be in the West End in this play called Best of Enemies. And I'm in the West End and it's really, it's really funny because I was, a friend of mine texted me yesterday and said, your face is off in the West End. <laughs> and I texted him back saying, you know what? It makes me happy, but I remember the days when that was just an impossibility. Yeah, yeah. 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 And actually, so it's, you know, when I, was, when I was having my breakdown, I was walking through town. One of the things I was doing was walking through town, looking for images of myself. And I couldn't see any, I couldn't see anything, anything. And uh, I started to panic and think I, I was disappearing. That's one of the things I said. But lo and behold, one of the faces I'm seeing is my own. <laughs> so it's kind of weird to, to sort, of, sort of get to a point where you can go into the West End and see a black face leading a show in the West End because we were just told that was impossible when we were, when I was coming out of drama school. That was just impossible. That's not going to happen, ever. So there's a whole range of parts out there for me to play. I probably don't even know half of them because, you know, again, I wasn't very academic as a kid. So if you've got some parts that you think I should play, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> Come to the court theatre. I'm sure they're doing something in the local Amdram. <laughs> they could squeeze you into Here the panto. Christmas panto. Yeah, I was going to say. They could. We don't twank it. You'd be the dame, yeah. Amazing. There you go. Booked. <laughs> but no, thank you so much for this. Like, we have run out of time now. So thank you so much for coming, Thank David. you very much Please. for coming. It'll get amazing.